All right, everybody, let's get started. Um, I assume everybody can hear me. My name is Dr. Katie Nelson. I'm a local allergist here in San Jose. Um, I actually have an office just right across the street over at Bellrose. And I'd like to thank you guys all for coming out and spending your, your hard-earned free time to come to our class tonight. And tonight we'll be talking about food allergy. Um, just as part of my introduction, um, I'm one of the four physicians that works over at South Bay Allergy and Asthma Group Incorporated. We're a medical group that serves patients with both pediatric and adult patients with allergies, asthma, and also immunodeficiencies. So we do um, many different types of adult and pediatric medicine that are related to the respiratory and nasal system. We have four doctors, um, Dr. Theodore Chu, who's the founding member and the other partner, Dr. Anlin Chu, and then Dr. John Kellogg and myself. So four doctors and we have three locations, uh, one here upright by O'Connor Hospital, one by Good Samaritan Hospital, and then one location um, that's a little bit further away in Mountain View right by El Camino Hospital. So if you have any allergy questions, tis the allergy season. So definitely let us know or, or stop by. We have many cards and brochures if you're interested. But let's get to our topic today, which is food allergy. I feel a little strange giving a talk on food allergy while everybody's eating, but hopefully there won't be any, any events here. So we'll be talking tonight about the nuts and bolts of food allergy. So some of our objectives tonight. So first of all, we're going to define what is a food allergy, and we're also going to try to distinguish food allergy as we understand it from other types of food reactions, such as food intolerance. Uh, we'll also discuss the most commonly implicated allergenic foods, so what you are most likely to be allergic to. And then we'll also be identifying common symptoms of food allergy. We'll be discussing the diagnostic evaluation as well as the treatment of food allergy as we understand it today. And then uh, most excitingly, we'll be talking about some of the new and very exciting directions in food allergy research and treatment that have come up in the past several years. And I'll be giving you up-to-date information. So I like to start every talk off with just a little bit of humor. Um, here's a cartoon and basically what it says is, the relationship was running smoothly until Sylvia developed a sudden intolerance to wheat. Obviously that's not gonna work out real well for her scarecrow boyfriend. So let's start out by defining food allergy. What is a food allergy? So food allergies uh, all fall under a large umbrella term of adverse food reaction. So an adverse food reaction is any kind of abnormal reaction that results from the ingestion of food. There are two broad categories under this very broad umbrella term. And the first one I'll mention is food intolerance. So a food intolerance is not technically a food allergy. It's actually a reaction to factors that are inherent to either a person or of a group of foods. So examples of this would be gluten intolerance or celiac disease, which has gotten lots of press lately. Also lactose intolerance. Um, in both of these diseases, there's a factor in whatever person is susceptible to it that makes them not able to tolerate the food. Another example of this is scromboid fish poisoning. Uh, scromboid poisoning actually can mimic allergy with flushing, hives, low blood pressure and some of the allergy type symptoms, but it's actually due to an inherent characteristic in a poisoned fish. So these are types of food intolerances. Now in contrast, we have food hypersensitivity, which is what we classically think of as food allergy. This too is a broad term, but what we'll be talking about today and focusing on is IgE mediated or allergy antibody mediated food allergy. There are other types of immune-based food hypersensitivity. Um, one of them is called oral allergy syndrome. It's also known as pollen food cross-reaction syndrome. And we'll be talking about that a little later as well. Um, another one that people here may have heard of is milk protein intolerance or milk protein allergy. This is common in young, young infants and can cause bloody diarrhea um, in infants. That usually resolves by one or two years of age. So all of these are immune mediated, but they're not the typical IgE or allergy type of food um, allergy that we think of when we think of a traditional food allergy. So for those of you who like to know the mechanism behind things um, and who are nerds like me and really like to understand how everything works, I did include this slide which gets a little bit technical for those of you with a scientific background or an interest. 
So this is the mechanism behind an IgE or allergy antibody mediated food allergy. So what happens is an antibody, which is a protein in our blood that's formed by the immune system, um, an allergy specific type of antibody forms against an ingested food protein. So say little Susie eats wheat cracker for the first time. So in Susie's body, an allergy antibody is being formed against proteins in the wheat. Next time Susie eats this cracker, the, um, the antibodies that have been preformed are still existing in her body and they bind to special allergy cells which are called mast cells and basophils. Um, then the food protein binds to these antibodies which are already on the cell and, um, and cause a release of chemicals from inside the cell. And these chemicals are the mediators which cause the symptoms of allergies such as hives, flushing, low blood pressure, etc. So that's the basis of the immune mechanism of type IgE mediated food, food allergy. So a few statistics on food allergy. I'm sure you've heard much about food allergy in the news. It's very, very common and it's, it's a very popular topic these days. It's quite common. So overall prevalence is about 6% in children under the age of 18. So 6% of kids under 18 do have a food allergy. Um, the prevalence in adults is still quite high. Three to four percent of adults have some sort of food allergy. The interesting thing is that they've done surveys and the perceived prevalence of food allergy is as high as 20 to 25 percent. Now obviously that's a bit of a disconnect from those who actually do have the food allergy and those who believe they have a food allergy. So there is a much higher perception of food allergy than is actually diagnosed. Um, the question often comes up, is food allergy genetic? There does seem to be a significant uh, genetic predisposition to food allergy. So if you are a, a child and your sibling or your parent has food allergy, you're significantly more likely to have a food allergy, particularly if your parent has a food allergy. Um, twin studies have been looked at with identical twins. It suggests about a 70% genetic factor, but the other 30% really can be due to more to the environment. And we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Food allergy has been increasing over the past three decades. And in fact, has more than doubled in the past 10 years alone. So there's been a lot of research being done over why is food allergy increasing at such a great rate. And there have been a couple of hypotheses. So one hypothesis is that um, our increased hygiene, especially in America and more developed countries, has led to the increase in all allergies, including food allergy. So let me explain this. This is called the hygiene hypothesis. So back in the day of the days of our ancestors, they worked on farms, they were exposed to many bacteria, they were exposed to lots of dirt, and in that dirt lives more and more bacteria. They became infected more often, they were sick more often, but yet they didn't have allergies like we do today. The hypothesis is that now in a world of antibacterial hand soaps, hand gels, uh, no offense to the hand soap be or the hand gel being given out and back, don't worry, you'll all be good, you're not gonna develop an allergy tonight. Um, in this world of antimicrobials and increased hygiene and less farming, as we've moved towards more of a, um, more of a urban centric um, population and less rural exposure, the thought is that the immune system isn't getting as infected so it's actually getting a little bit bored. And what do people do when, they bored? when they're bored? They find something else to occupy themselves. So in this case, the thought is that the immune system is actually causing more allergies because it's a little bit bored because there's nothing else to fight off. So that is one proposed mechanism for the recent increase in food allergies. There's also been a lot of data that has suggested that the increased use of pesticides um, in our communities as well as pollution may um, cause genetic modifications in the genes around food allergy susceptible um, areas of the chromosomes and this may in fact lead to um, an upregulation of genes causing food allergies. And there's actually some very active research at Stanford going on right now about this very topic. So these are some of the theories as to why food allergies are actually increasing in incidence. Of course, for this little young man right there, I don't think he's going to have any problem playing in the mud as he is. So the big question is, which foods most commonly cause food allergies? Now, technically any food that is a protein can cause a food allergy. 
However, there are seven major types of food that tend to cause food allergies. One is milk or dairy. The other big one is soy. We also have eggs, both the white and the yolk, but more commonly the egg white, which is where more protein is, is localized, will cause allergy. Wheat is a common cause of allergy. Seafood, so fish, and then also shellfish, um, clams, oysters, lobster, crab, etc., cause allergies. And then, of course, everybody has heard of peanut allergy and tree nut allergy, which are um, unfortunately in the news quite a bit as cause of. Uh, because they cause quite a bit of morbidity and mortality. So there are a number of different foods that cause allergies, but these are, are really our top seven. Um, interestingly, there's a lot of cross-reactivity between foods that cause allergies. So I have a, a little chart here that shows basically if you're allergic to a certain type of food, how likely it is to cross-react. So for example, if you're allergic to one sort of shellfish, you have a 75% chance of having a reaction to another sort of shellfish. If you have an allergic reaction to a peanut or a tree nut, you have a 35 to 50% chance of having another allergic reaction to a different kind of peanut or a tree nut. So these are some important cross-reactivities. Interestingly, you'll notice that um, people that are allergic to cow's milk only have a five to 10% chance of being allergic to beef. Even though they're coming from the same animal, the proteins are different. However, they do have uh, about a 90% chance of being allergic to goat's milk. So that's something important to realize. Just because it's not the same species, they can have the same proteins that cause allergies. One other question that people often have is, does age matter? Is it only young children who develop food allergies or can adults as well? And I see somebody shaking her head back there. Absolutely, you can get food allergies at any age. Um, I have many adults who come in, even in their 50s, 60s, and 70s and say, you know, I just started eating cantaloupe. I've been eating cantaloupe all my life. Now I have an itchy mouth and I'm coughing every time I eat it. And I have to explain to them, you can really develop a food allergy at any age. There are, however, certain food allergens that tend to develop um, reactions in younger kids. So, allergens such as milk, soy, egg, and wheat tend to develop in children that are less than two years of age. So these are the very young kids that tend to get these allergies. The good news is that they do also tend to resolve with age. So approximately 80% of food allergies um, to milk, soy, egg, and wheat will resolve by the time kids are 15 or 16. However, there is a 20% um, probability that the allergies will not resolve. Additionally, there are allergies that are more likely to occur in adults and older children. These include seafood, shellfish, peanut, and tree nut allergies. So these usually occur um, in people that are over the age of two, and unfortunately, they do tend to persist. Um, approximately 20% of people will tend to outgrow these type of allergies as they get older. So oftentimes we hear more about these allergies because they are more persistent in the population. Interestingly though, there's a lot of um, research being done right now, and I'll talk about this later, about um, how, to hasten the ex uh, how, how to hasten the outgrowth of food allergies through exposure. So we'll be talking about that a little bit later. So let's move on to symptoms of food allergy. This is a good picture that dis depicts um, some of the symptoms that you can have if you are having an allergic reaction to food. Now these symptoms are the same as any other type of allergic reaction. So the caveat here is that these symptoms must occur after exposure to food. Usually it's momentarily, it can happen within minutes, but you can also have symptoms up to several hours later. But usually within the first two hours, um, after exposure to a food, if you have these symptoms, it's good to suspect a food allergy. So some of our symptoms include um, skin. We have urticaria or hives, and we'll, we'll have some pictures of a hive rash um, coming up. Also skin swelling or angioedema. These are by far the most common symptoms that we see with food allergy. So if you have hives or swelling after eating a certain food, definitely get tested for a food allergy. You can have symptoms in the mouth and throat. These are allergy cells giving off their chemicals in the mouth and throat causing itching. Swelling, if the throat is swelling up, sometimes people tend to drool. So that can be an important uh, symptom, especially in children. The respiratory system can be affected. So oftentimes we have people that start clearing their throat, they cough. If they have asthma, they may wheeze or have a bad asthma attack. 
um, people that don't have asthma may start to have that feeling that they can't breathe, that they have pressure on their chest, that they're very short of breath. These are some of the respiratory symptoms of food allergy. Abdominal symptoms include nausea, emesis shortly after eating a food, diarrhea, and some people do have severe abdominal pain, although these abdominal symptoms are less common. Um, and then the symptoms that we really get concerned about um, in addition to the respiratory symptoms, systemic symptoms such as um, hypotension or low blood pressure, tachycardia, high heart rate. Um, this leads to a reaction called anaphylaxis, which can be very severe and even life-threatening. So here are some pictures of the symptoms of food allergy that we can actually see. So I'm gonna try using this pointer here. This is a picture, and all these pictures are from Google. Thank goodness for Google Images. Um, this is a picture of hives or urticaria. You can see that they are raised red bumps, often circular or very um, undulating in, in shape. What they do, tend to do is they'll appear on one part of the body, oftentimes the face or the trunk, and then spread to other parts of the body over three, uh, two to three days. They're usually very itchy and they're very distinct. So these are hives. This is a picture of an unfortunate man who is having a significant amount of throat swelling. I wish we had a picture of what a normal throat looks like, but believe me when I tell you, these big red swollen things usually aren't there. That's swelling around the tonsils and the side and the posterior, the back of the throat. So he is having throat swelling. And when you see this, you know that there's likely swelling even further down in the throat that you can't see. This is an unfortunate young man who clearly has had some lip swelling or what we call angioedema. So um, oftentimes you can see the swelling on the face. Sometimes you'll have swelling of the limbs. You'll have swelling of other body parts. But what we really get concerned about is if there's swelling we can't see. So I'd almost rather see some of these symptoms than have the other symptoms that we're not able to detect quite as readily. So next I have a little movie clip for you and I'm going to try to seamlessly uh, transition over to it, but I thought it was a, a somewhat humorous um, depiction of food allergy in a, a movie called Hitch that came out in 2005 with um, Kevin James and uh, Will Smith. And it's a great movie, but they actually did a really excellent job of portraying a, a food allergy reaction. So let me try to do that for you. One moment. So food, food, okay, we can hear me. Food allergies are no laughing matter, but I really did think that the media did a good job of portraying um, a typical reaction um, in that particular clip. So let me just speed through here. Okay, so our next topic, which is also no laughing matter, is food-induced anaphylaxis. And this is the thing that we are always all concerned about. So the question is, what is anaphylaxis or anaphylactic shock? So anaphylaxis is a systemic reaction involving multiple organ systems, in, like, for example, hives and reduced blood pressure, throat swelling, wheezing. Um, coughing, any combination of two systemic symptoms means that you're having an anaphylactic reaction. These can absolutely be fatal. Um, the thing to remember about food allergies and allergic reactions in general is that one allergic reaction does not predict another. Just because Hitch has had hives 
does not mean that, and swelling, does not mean that next time he's not going, going to have a drop in blood pressure and a raise in heart rate and really get into trouble. So just because you've had hives in the past doesn't mean that you are not going to have a severe reaction the next time. This unfortunately was illustrated, as many of you may know, um, in the case of BJ Hom. He was a young man, I think he was 17 or 18 years old, um, here in San Jose. He had a history of a peanut allergy. Um, he did not carry an EpiPen because he had always known that his reactions were hives and didn't feel that they would be serious. Unfortunately, he was on a trip out of the country and he ate something that clearly had contained some kind of nut. Um, he had an anaphylactic reaction and unfortunately passed away before the, the paramedics could get to him. So this is just a solemn reminder that food allergies can be extremely serious and one reaction doesn't predict another. So risk factors for a severe reaction. Anyone at any time can have a severe food allergic reaction. However, if you have any of the following factors, you are more at risk. So one of them is asthma. People with asthma are definitely at higher risk for having severe reactions because their airways are, are already twitchy and overreactive. They have a higher chance of having a, a lung reaction if they're having food allergy reaction. People who have allergies to peanut and tree nut, for whatever reason, these just tend to be more severe allergies. So peanut and tree nut are, are some of the allergies that we absolutely do not mess around with. Um, those are very, very serious allergies. Adolescents are at risk for many things for many reasons. Um, however, they are also at risk for food-induced anaphylaxis because as we all know, adolescents aren't always the most responsible, uh, many of them at least, um, with you know, telling about their symptoms and paying attention to their bodies and taking care of themselves. There are certainly adolescents who are on it, who are great about their food allergies and great about their medical care, um, but unfortunately, many, uh, many of today's youth think that they're going to live forever, and unfortunately, in the case of food allergy, that's not, um, that's not always um, uh, gonna save you from a reaction. Another thing that can give you um, a higher risk of having uh, anaphylactic reaction would be a delay of treatment. So a delay or not administering epinephrine for a reaction. So say somebody had a reaction where their throat was feeling a little bit tingly and they thought, well, you know, let's not give the EpiPen or let's not give the um, OVIQ auto injector, let's just wait. Those people are at higher risk of having um, a systemic reaction because they're not stopping the initial reaction in its tracks. There's also a relationship between food allergy and eczema. And eczema is a defect in skin barrier that's very common in children but can persist into adulthood. So about one third of children with moderate to severe eczema have IgE-mediated food allergy. Uh, many of their skin symptoms are often provoked by eating a specific food or several specific foods, and it does seem to be age dependent. Younger children with severe eczema, moderate to, to severe eczema, do tend to have more food allergies than those that persist into adulthood. Um, so we do recommend that kids with uh, moderate to severe eczema be tested for food allergy, particularly if they're less than five years old, if their eczema persists despite ma maximal medical therapy, or there's a history of immediate eczema worsening or rash after a certain food. Uh, one topic which I'm particularly interested in and I think is actually very neat is called oral allergy syndrome. Has anyone here heard of oral allergy syndrome? It's a very interesting uh, um, syndrome that um, many people don't know about. So what it is, is some people get mouth and throat itching and tingling after eating certain fruits, vegetables, and nuts, but they're not technically allergic to those. What happens is they're actually allergic to a pollen. Around here, it's usually birch pollen or grass pollen. And the proteins in these pollens are very, very similar looking to the proteins that cause allergies in certain fruits and vegetables and nuts. So what happens is when a pollen allergic patient eats these certain foods like apple, peach, um, melon, um, almond can be implicated as well, what happens is their body recognizes it as something that it's allergic to and causes tingling in the mouth and throat area where the allergen has been ingested. 
Um, the good thing about this reaction is it's almost always just localized to the mouth and throat. It almost never turns into a, a severe progressive anaphylactic reaction. However, it can be really annoying if you're trying to eat an almond and your mouth is always itching. Um, usually this is fresh fruits and vegetables. Um, cooking tends to destroy the allergenicity. So many people say, you know, I can tolerate cooked apples or baked apples, but I cannot tolerate fresh apples. So you will see that a lot. Um, here are some of the pollens that are implicated. So birch often cross-reacts with apples and some of the stone fruits like apricot and cherry, also plum, kiwi, and carrots. Ragweed, which we don't have as much of a problem here, but we do um, have big problems back east and in the Midwest with ragweed, can cross-react with banana, cucumber, and all of the melons. So melon and ragweed go together quite often. And then people who are allergic to grass, which we have plenty of here and it's pollinating now, can cross-react with cherry, peach, potato, and tomato. So if any of you have mouth itching when you eat any of these foods, think, am I allergic to pollens? Because this might be what's going on. So let's talk a little bit about how we currently diagnose food allergy. Um, the best way to diagnose food allergy, as per um, our allergy ruling body, is by doing uh, what we call a double-blind, placebo-controlled food challenge. That's a whole lot of words, which basically mean feeding the person the food that we suspect may be causing an allergy. Sounds dangerous, doesn't it? We think you might have an allergy, so we're gonna give, the, give you that food. Well, it can be a little bit tricky. So what we do is we have a patient come into the office um, and we give them small amounts of what they might be allergic to. Oftentimes what we do is we'll touch it to their lip, wait 15 minutes and observe them closely with vital signs, um, being taken, continuous physical exams, et cetera, et cetera. Then we touch it to their tongue, wait 15 minutes. And then we have them take a small bite, wait a certain amount of time, and then take a larger bite and then wait in our clinic to see if there's any reaction. Oftentimes, there's so much anxiety with the patient, particularly with a child, um, among, uh, around taking in the food that, to which they've had a reaction in the past that they don't even want to do it. So we ha oftentimes are, have to, um, are recommended to disguise the food either in a pill capsule or um, with a placebo to make sure that um, the, pair, uh, the, the patient isn't having a reaction that's more supratentorial or um, less allergy-based and more mind-based. Um, after we do this, the patient is monitored for any reactions. This is about 99% accurate in identifying food allergy. Um, the pro is that it is so accurate. The con is that obviously you're giving a patient something to which they are allergic, so therefore the, you do have the potential for serious reactions. Despite the fact that um, the American College of Allergy, um, Asthma and Immunology recommends this as the gold standard for treating people or for um, diagnosing people with food allergies, in practice, many allergists prefer to do skin testing or blood testing prior to doing any sort of food challenge just because it is so risky. So this isn't something that we routinely do to diagnose a food allergy. But I did think I would, I thought I would mention it just because it is what's technically recommended. So in practice, we do screen for those who, people who are allergic first with skin testing or blood testing. So let's talk a little bit about skin prick testing. This is usually the preferred method of diagnosing a food allergy in clinical practice. So the principle behind the skin testing is that allergy cells are present everywhere in the body. So the same allergy cells that cause reactions in your throat and your mouth and your nose and your lungs are also present in the skin. Um, so the technique is that a small amount of protein from each food that we're testing is put into this device here. So what this is, you can see someone's finger, this is very, very small, is that it's a little plastic comb, not a needle, plastic comb. And this plastic comb is scratched very lightly across the skin. It almost feels like a tiny little pinch. It's more annoying than painful. And what this does is it places a small amount of food protein under the skin. And if the patient has an allergy to the, uh, that specific food protein, the area becomes red, it becomes itchy, and it becomes a little bit swollen. But typically people don't have the systemic type of reaction they would have if they ingested the food. Um, usually we observe the reaction over about 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and a positive test, like these tests right here, you can see how they're different from these tests here. 
These are positive tests. They're red. If you saw very closely, they would have a little raised area that we consider a wheel. Um, so the pros of this type of um, testing is that it's very easy to do. It can be done at any allergist's office. We can test any food. If you have some kind of fish um, from the Philippines that isn't available in America that we don't have um, specific testing for, you can bring in the fish. We can uh, poke the fish and then we'll poke you. So it's very easy, it's very versatile, and it only takes 15 to 20 minutes. Um, the pitfall is that it's only 50 to 70% sensitive and specific, which means that it's only about 70% accurate. Um, so not all food allergies are diagnosed using this method. Um, additionally, not all food aller uh, some of the times this method can overdiagnose food allergies. Um, so it's not always 100% the most accurate. However, it is the most accurate test that we have that we feel is considered safe at this point in time. Interestingly, um, the size of the reaction, you can see there are many different sizes here. It does not necessarily correlate with the severity of a potential reaction. It does, however, correlate with the uh, likelihood that a person will have a reaction. So a person that has a very small uh, bump has a much lower chance of having a reaction than does somebody with a large bump. So the results may not actually indicate clinical food allergy. We always have to take it with a grain of salt and correlate with any symptoms that are present. There are a couple other ways that people use to diagnose food allergy as well. Um, some of you may have heard of blood testing. Basically what we're doing is we're looking for that specific allergy antibody that's in the blood to whichever foods that you desire to test. In the olden days, it was called a RAST test, a radio um, absorbent allergen test. Nowadays, we just call it specific IgE testing, though some older practitioners may uh, still call it a RAS test. What it does is it measures that specific allergy antibody to any food um, that you would like to be measured to. Um, the great thing about it is that it is only a blood test. Um, it's easier for um, children often than getting multiple little skin prick tests on their back. However, there are significant pitfalls. In general, it's not very sensitive and it's not specific, which means that it's not totally accurate. Um, oftentimes, the results we get do not correlate with symptoms. Um, for example, I had a patient who had a high allergy test level to milk who drinks milk every single day of her life and never has a reaction. Does she have a milk allergy? No. Does she have this specific allergy antibody to milk? Yes. So presence of the allergy antibody doesn't always mean that there is the potential for a reaction. So it can get a little confusing. Also, the number that is, is generated as a result doesn't indicate severity of the reaction. It too also indicates how likely they are to have a reaction. So this will only give you likelihood of reaction, not how severe a reaction could potentially be. So this is generally helpful in diagnosis only when combined with skin testing and clinical symptoms. Alone, I don't feel that these tests are terribly diagnostic. Um, we get a lot of people referred in, mostly from uh, pediatricians and family practitioners who, have, who are you know, trying to help these patients valiantly with their food allergies and end up sending a huge allergy panel and they're allergic to everything and then we have to help interpret it with a grain of salt. So um, oftentimes these blood tests can be very difficult to interpret. Um, sometimes people do do what's called a food elimination diet as well. Um, people do do a uh, elimination of all of the seven top allergenic foods, or you can do an, a targeted elimination of a suspected offending food. For example, if you suspect that wheat is causing an allergy, but the, all the allergy testing is negative, you can eliminate wheat and see if the allergy symptoms go away. So that's another way of potentially testing for food allergy. So let's talk a little bit about treatment of food allergies. So mild reactions, which I consider to be mild hives or skin itching only, can be safely treated with an antihistamine. However, if the reaction is progressing, we recommend um, doing um, injectable epinephrine sooner rather than later. So any kind of moderate to severe reaction, which I classify as anything besides just minor skin itching and hives, so throat itching, throat tightness, difficulty breathing, coughing, vomiting, severe abdominal pain, feeling dizzy, passing out, severe drooling, or just not feeling white after eating a food that you know you're allergic to, those are all times where it's appropriate to use an epinephrine auto-injector. 
Now I used to be able to say EpiPen because that was really what was out there for an epinephrine auto injector. However, now we have another product on the market which I'll talk about as well. So I'm just gonna use the blanket term epinephrine auto injector. And what that is, is it's a life-saving medication that tightens up all of the blood vessels and halts an allergic reaction. In its, in its tracks. And people who have allergies to bee stings, um, other venom, and also food allergies too tend to carry these around with them because um, it's the safest way to, to proceed um, in case of accidental exposure. Um, typically, once you use an epinephrine auto injector, we recommend that you be seen in either an emergency room or evaluated in a clinician office. Oftentimes with our patients, if they've had a mild reaction and they've had to use their EpiPen, they call us, they come into our office, we check them out, we give them any additional medications they might need like antihistamines, steroids. Um, in the emergency room, if you're being checked out for a uh, food allergic reaction, you may be given IV antihistamines, IV steroids, um, or intravenous fluids if your blood pressure is low. Um, all patients should be evaluated, whether it be in a clinic or in the emergency room, and observed for several hours. Typically in the emergency room, we say four to six hours, because remember, even though an, a, a reaction seems to be stable, it could suddenly get worse. Um, another form of treatment is avoidance. Oftentimes, this is the hardest form of treatment because you saw the list. It's hard to avoid dairy. It's very hard to avoid soy. It's hard to avoid wheat. So this is very difficult for many of our patients, especially our patients with multiple food allergies. At some point, it becomes a question of what can we actually feed them. Um, avoidance is um, very difficult. It, um, it um, involves lots of label reading, so all breads, all crackers, everything that's from the grocery store, reading labels. A lot of our patients end up making their own food. Um, they, they're afraid to go out to dinner. It's a problem at school because these kids often are afraid to eat hot lunch. So um, avoidance can be very difficult, but is the most effective to, uh, form of treatment for food allergy besides epinephrine. Um, so I'll just mention very briefly, and I'm sorry this turned out so blurry, the importance, especially for children, of a food allergy action plan. So what we do with all of our patients with food allergies is we give them a plan of exactly what they need to do. This, this um, is something that they can put on their refrigerators, it's something that they can give to care providers, whether it be at school, um, at daycare, or grandparents, um, whoever, or babysitter, whoever is caring for um, the child or adult. So basically what this does is it shows us um, if you have symptoms of hives, then you should take Benadryl and watch closely. But if you have symptoms of coughing, choking, wheezing, low blood pressure, any other symptoms, you should use your EpiPen and call 911. Um, it also identifies what the patient is allergic to. There's a place up here, as well as um, um, whether they have asthma or not. And this can be actually very helpful for emergency personnel, particularly when it's a child and the parent is not with them, such as at school or with a babysitter. So we do advocate for all of our patients to have a, a food allergy action plan. So talking very briefly about injectable epinephrine. So epinephrine is that, that, that chemical that can, um, the medication that can stop an allergic reaction in its tracks. We currently have two forms of epinephrine. We have an EpiPen. This is a pen form. Um, it comes in a two pack. So each is one separate dose. So if you would, for whatever reason, not have resolution with the first dose, you could use a second dose. Um, the EpiPen has been around for a very, very long time. How you use it is you basically hold it around the middle. The action end is this end. This is where the needle comes out of. You take off the cap, kind of like a grenade, and then you plunge it into the outside of the thigh until it clicks. And these are all trainers, trust me. I'm not, I'm not stabbing myself with a needle. So if anybody wants to try, we have one up here. You hold for 10 seconds and then you call the authorities, whether it be 911 or your physician if you already have an allergy physician. So these have been around for a long time. Um, their main drawback, in my opinion, is they're not very intuitive to use. So in the heat of the moment, it's very hard to remember where the needle comes out of, especially if you haven't used this often. We've had many times where people put their finger over where the needle is and they've actually um, lost fingers due to this because what happens is the epinephrine causes vasoconstriction, the red blood cell, or the, um, the uh, arteries to constrict and cuts off blood supply to the thumb. So it can be very difficult to use. 
which is why they come up with a new product, which I think is very cool. It's called the AviQ. It's also an um, epinephrine injector. You can see that it's differently shaped. It's more wallet shaped for our, um, our men and teenagers in the crowd who do not want to carry a very bulky EpiPen and do not have a purse. They both fit very well in a purse, by the way, but oftentimes this is a little bit better for the, the hip pocket. The very interesting thing about this is that it's all auditory. Um, so I'll let you guys take it out and play with it if you'd like after the presentation because it, it, it'll get a little long otherwise. But basically, once you remove this trainer from the packet, it will talk you through giving the epinephrine injection. We'll tell you exactly how to do it. Basically what you do is you take it out, you push it against the leg, it'll walk you through everything and it will actually count the five seconds for you. So, and then it tells you to go seek help. So this is a new product on the market. Um, we just started using it. I've had a number of patients really like it, especially for people who have grandparents taking care of children who are uncomfortable with the EpiPen. So this is another option in our epinephrine stockpile. So there are a number of different social considerations also for people with food allergies. Um, anxiety is a major problem. So oftentimes these are kids who have had food allergies since they've been little and they've always been told that they could potentially die if they eat a peanut. It oftentimes leads to them not wanting to be in social situations, to having difficulty at school, and that's just very heartbreaking. Um, there's also a significant stigma with food allergy and can lead to significant social isolation. Oftentimes these kids aren't going to sleepovers, they're not sharing food at the lunch table with other kids, and so they can feel very, very isolated. Um, there has been a phenomenon in the last five to ten years of having peanut-free tables in elementary schools. Um, in theory, I think this is a great idea, but in practice, it does not work all the time. So first of all, um, now you're singling out these kids with food allergy and making them you know, sit together or sit alone, uh, which is never a good thing socially. And I'll tell you the story of a patient. Um, one of my little patients um, within the last year was autistic, and she was being made to sit at a peanut-free table at her school. And she was the only one sitting there, so it was adversely affecting her social development. And the kids at the gluten-free table were teasing her, calling her peanut girl. Which I just thought, you know, it, it was somewhat humorous, but just very sad. So we actually had to write a letter to the school, and we had her removed from the peanut-free table um, with the parents, recognizing that this could potentially be a problem if she were to ingest something. But she's eight, and she knows not to eat peanuts and she always has her EpiPen handy. So the peanut-free table, while a good idea in theory, is not always a good idea in practice, and I'm actually not a huge fan of the peanut-free table. Um, there's also been a significant amount of bullying in schools regarding food allergy. Um, there was a survey of 350 teens and adults, and about uh, a quarter of them reported bullying um, due to their food allergy. And most of those had multiple episodes of bullying in the school. And sadly, about a fifth of the perpetrators were teachers and school staff, which is just absolutely sad. Um, in several school districts in our area, there are principals who refuse to have their teachers and aides trained in EpiPens, which I could do for all of you in about five minutes. Um, there's generally a very poor awareness of food allergies, and despite us offering to come into the schools and help, um, they're really turning, a a, a, a turning away from us. So this is a huge area where I think we could improve um, in our school system. There's always also the issue of accidental exposure. Oftentimes, the, the subject of peanuts on planes has been brought up. Um, it's a potential threat. If you do have an incredibly sensitive person with a peanut allergy, having peanuts on plane, it can be aerosolized into the air. So that's why a lot of the airlines have stopped carrying nuts which you'll notice. Now, granted, airlines have stopped carrying everything. They're soon gonna be charging for water and air, but that's another reason that you're not getting your packages of peanuts anymore from American Airlines. So we've gone over all of the um, statistics about food allergy, most common foods, symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment. So now we come to the more exciting part of my talk, at least it excites me, which is the new directions that um, we're taking in food allergy. So there's been a lot of research done, particularly over the last five to 10 years, some of which has been done here in Silicon Valley, right up at Stanford, um, on a number of different topics. So we're gonna discuss um, the changing paradigm of avoidance versus exposure. 
We'll talk about different potential treatments for food allergy, including oral immunotherapy and epicutaneous or skin immunotherapy. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit about extensively heated or baked allergen ingestion as a potential treatment for some food allergies. So you can see this little one that's um, smeared up here with peanut. Um, in the year 2000, um, the American Academy of Pediatrics um, came out with guidelines stating that um, all children should avoid most allergenic foods until the age of three. So they, avoid, they recommended that dairy not be introduced until after the age, age of one, and that uh, most other allergenic foods, including peanuts, tree nuts, and seafood, be avoided until after the age of three. Um, that was in 2000. Between the, between the years of 2000 and 2008, there was such a rapid increase in food allergy that in 2008, due to um, the rapid increase as well as some new data, they had to reverse their decision and say that they had no, um, they had no recommendations on avoiding um, introduction and delaying introduction of foods. Because research is now suggesting that early exposure may actually be protective against food allergy. Um, one of our landmark studies was done by a Frenchman called um, Gideon Dutois. Um, and also his friend Gideon Lack. What they did was they um, took two cohorts. They took a group of Israeli school, school children in Israel and Israeli school children who lived in the United Kingdom, had been born and raised in the United Kingdom, but were both of Israeli descent. Now the difference between the two groups was that the school children in Israel had from a very young age, four to six months, been fed a treat called Bomba, B-O-M-B-A, with peanut powder in it. So these kids were, in essence, exposed to peanut powder on a near weekly basis from very, very early on. The kids, however, who were raised in Great Britain had had complete peanut avoidance. And what they did was they looked at the incidence of allergies in the Great Britain cohort versus the ones who had been um, exposed to food allergy, or the food allergen, the peanut, in um, Israel. And what they found was that the kids that were um, exposed to the peanut in um, Israel were actually significantly less, about 17 times less likely to develop a peanut allergy than the ones who had been avoiding peanut completely in Israel. So this study completely rocked our view of whether avoidance or exposure was more important in the prevention of food allergy. Um, they're currently doing a study that where the results are gonna be um, released in 2014 looking prospectively at whether giving peanut at an early age causes more food allergy or prevents food allergy. So there's a lot of ongoing research. But studies are still conflicting. There was a very recent study that came out um, that suggested that exposure to um, egg under the age of six months was correlated with food allergy, but also avoidance of certain foods like wheat and fish and nuts under the age of six to nine months also increased food allergy. So is it avoidance? Is it exposure? There's really no good answer right now. I tend to think it's probably uh, better to expose these kids um, than not to expose them just based on current research. Um, so given that the American Academy of Pediatrics has now reversed its ruling and says that they have insufficient evidence to rec continue to recommend delaying foods. So when people ask me, and I trained as a pediatric allergist, I do always say, um, you know, I would not delay introduction of any foods. Um, I, don't, I did the same for my daughter who's now two years old. I did not delay a single food. She had peanut butter when she was about five months old. Um, and she has, you know, knock on wood, so far not had any issues with food allergy. Um, however, the evidence is very conflicting, and so we do need more studies. But currently, the paradigm is shifting more towards exposure rather than avoidance to prevent food allergy. So the question always comes up, what do we do with exposure during pregnancy and breastfeeding? So I'll say it um, flat out, pregnancy is protective against allergy, I'm sorry, breastfeeding is protective against allergy in general. So um, breastfeeding for greater than three or four months not only decreases the incidence of eczema, but it also decreases the incidence in development of childhood wheezing. So breastfeeding for greater than three or four months is very important in the prevention of allergy. But the question always comes up, should these mothers be restricting what they're eating either during pregnancy or lactation because some of the proteins from whatever the mother is eating can pass through the mother's milk 
into the baby and potentially cause um, food reactions and food allergies. Currently, the recommendation, and this is what I tell my patients too, is that the restriction of maternal diet during pregnancy and lactation is not recommended. Um, there is no evidence really to say whether you know, patients should stop eating certain foods during pregnancy or lactation. Unless the baby is having a reaction every time milk is ingested by the mother, then we have to think, okay, well, let's eliminate the milk and then see what happens. But typically, we don't recommend any kind of um, dietary restriction. There was a study done in 2010 uh, by Hugh Sampson, who is the big food guru up at New York in um, uh, Mount Sinai School of Medicine. He did find some correlation with peanut consumption during pregnancy and the development of peanut sensitization. However, he didn't actually look at peanut allergy in these kids. All he did was look at the blood levels of the allergy antibody, which, as we know from earlier, doesn't necessarily correlate with actual allergy. So really, there hasn't been much c compelling data to support avoidance of anything during pregnancy or breastfeeding. So a couple more advances in food allergy to talk about. So an interesting advance in diagnostics is um, peanut component testing. So I mentioned earlier that there was no way to know from the blood testing whether people were going to have a severe versus a mild reaction. Well, that's not entirely true. There is now a test developed called the you know peanut test. It's so you know what you're getting into. And basically what that does is it looks at different proteins um, that are found in the peanut that people are allergic to. And they've been shown that certain proteins are, are more correlated with severe allergic reactions. Um, those proteins I've listed up here just in case anyone is interested, they're called ERA H1, 2, 3, and 9. But there's also proteins that people are allergic to in peanuts that cause less severe allergic reactions like minor hives. Um, and that's been associated with ERA H8. So they're actually able to test for each of these different proteins. And based on this protein testing, they're able to tell you with about 90 to 95% confidence whether you're likely to have a severe allergic reaction or just a mild allergic reaction. Um, this, unfortunately, is not covered by insurance. It, co it costs about $300 out of pocket. I typically only recommend it for my patients who really want to know you know, is eating a tiny bit of peanut going to cause severe anaphylaxis or is it likely just to cause hives? Um, but it is available and component testing is also available for egg and milk, although it's not quite as helpful. Um, a couple advances in treatment that I'll mention, probiotics um, have been shown to be helpful in food allergy induced eczema. So they're doing studies with probiotics and food allergies right now as we speak. Additionally, there have been some Chinese herbal medicines um, that have been used in China for many, many, many years that look like they also pr help prevent and treat food allergy. So um, the one that they're looking at is called FAHF2. Looks like it's effective in mice, and they currently have a phase two study, which is safety and efficacy in humans, that's ongoing. And most of that research is being done up at Mount Sinai um, Hospital in New York. There's also a very interesting um, mode of therapy called epicutaneous immunotherapy. Basically what it is, it's, it's like a nicotine patch, but it is for peanuts. So um, this is what it is. It's basically a patch that has a little bit of peanut protein. You wear it on your arm for X number of hours a day uh, for a certain number of days a week. And it's supposed to release small amounts of peanut into the bloodstream to train your immune system to not overreact when it does see larger amounts of peanut. And it goes in increasing doses over a year. This is currently also um, continuing to be in phase two trials, so it's definitely not ready for the market yet. Um, they've also done this in milk, and I believe the peanut immune, uh, epicutaneous immunotherapy, the Viaskin, is in trials currently at, at Stanford. But the data actually looks quite promising, so this might be a potential therapeutic option. What gets most of the press, and you may have seen a recent New York Times article on food allergy that focuses on the food allergy oral immunotherapy program at Stanford, which I actually participated in, not as a patient, but as a provider when I was a fellow there, um, is um, oral immunotherapy. So let's talk about what we mean by oral immunotherapy. Um, basically, the principle is that we're trying to deliver very small amounts of whatever allergenic food we're trying to cure. So in many cases, it's peanut or milk. And we administer very small amounts in increasing doses over time to try to alter the immune response. Basically, what happens in a peanut allergic person is their immune system sees a peanut and freaks out. 
has a bad reaction, can't stop, and starts firing off cells and chemicals, 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 and that is what causes an allergic reaction. Whereas my body, which is not allergic to peanut, will see a peanut and say, eh, no big deal. So what we want to get from is we want to try to fool the immune system from that overreaction to not thinking that peanut is a very big deal. So there is a lot of research being done. Um, the first bits of research were being done at Duke, and they are by far the leader. However, Stanford's catching up to them. Uh, Dr. Kari Nato, a wonderful colleague of mine at Stanford, is a genius, and she's doing many food allergy trials. Um, the first st uh, study was actually published in 2011. Uh, for peanut oral immunotherapy. There have been many studies that have been published since. The data is showing about 25 to 60 percent of the patients that undergo this do have resolution of their peanut allergy. However, it comes at a high cost. Um, at least a quarter of them are having severe enough reactions to need to use epinephrine. Baked egg with these modified proteins on a daily basis for six months to a year, they tend to grow out of their allergies. They tend to grow out of their allergies three times as fast. They tend to outgrow their allergies, and they're 15 to 20 times more likely than people who are not having baked milk or egg to outgrow these allergies. So this is actually something that is now very widely accepted. Um, there are several places in the Bay Area that are doing these challenges. We call them baked milk or baked egg challenges. Um, and I'll describe the process in a moment. And we're happy to um, offer both of these challenges over at our office um, at South Bay Allergy and Asthma. So this is a new program that we've started. It's been going on for about five months now, and it's been remarkably successful. And what we did is we modeled our protocol after those that were used in all of the famous studies that worked out so well. So I'll go through each of these two different uh, challenges. So we have a baked milk challenge and a baked egg challenge. For both of these, we have an initial screening visit where we make sure that the patient actually does have a milk or an egg allergy. So we do skin testing, we do blood testing, we ask about symptoms. We also confirm that they have an EpiPen ready in case they were to have a reaction. If the patient is able to screen in, what we do is we schedule them for a baked food challenge. The initial step to both means baking, and this, the patient bakes because trust me, I don't bake. Um, neither do my partners. Um, the uh, patient bakes either um, a, product, a muffin containing a certain amount of milk or a certain amount of egg protein. And what we have them do is they come into clinic, they're usually around for three or four hours, and we feed them the muffin with either baked milk or baked egg little by little in four pieces over the course of an hour or two and make sure that they don't have a reaction. Now some patients will have mouth itching and some patients will have hives or other forms of reaction. At that point, we have all of the medications available to stop any sort of reaction. We are also able to um, halt at any time. If the patient's able to ingest the baked milk uh, muffin or the baked egg muffin, we have them go home eating a similar muffin or baked product every day for six months. At the end of those six months, the patients are very likely to be able to, if they're egg allergic, tolerate scrambled eggs, or if they're milk allergic, tolerate baked cheese, which has even more milk protein than baked, um, baked milk. Um, for those who are milk allergic, we have them um, ingest the baked cheese for another six months. If they're able to tolerate that, we have them come in and drink a glass of milk. Um, patients are followed by phone every two weeks, and we see them in clinic every one to two months. And there is a doctor on call 24 hours a day, seven days a week, in case people are having reactions. However, we have not had, knock on wood, anybody have a reaction yet, and we have multiple patients in this protocol right now. Um, other details, this program is very, very safe. Um, these are all oral challenges that are done under very supervised conditions um, in our office with constant doctor contact. So we're doing a physical exam every 15 minutes. There's always a nurse available. Patients are monitored very closely. Patients are always discharged with um, an EpiPen or other auto injector. Um, some of the benefits, you're 15 to 20 times more likely to outgrow your milk or egg allergy if you follow this protocol. That's what the research has shown. Um, and you're also going to outgrow it faster than if you don't have the baked food. So I think this is very exciting. Um, additionally, there's no lengthy wait list. Basically, all you need to do is give us a call and schedule an appointment if you're interested, and there's no additional cost to patients. This is like an office visit, so there's no special cost for the program. 
Um, are you or your child a candidate? If you're over age one, if you have a diagnosis of milk or egg allergy, your asthma or eczema is well controlled, and if you're not pregnant, you are definitely a candidate. So if anyone's interested, we do have cards and brochures, just give us a call. So I have about three more minutes left, and then we'll get to questions, but here are some common scenarios that people may, um, may encounter. So primary care physician or pulmonologist or some other Dr. Z sends a food allergy panel which shows that little Susie is allergic to nuts, egg, and milk, and many other foods. However, she eats all of these foods. What should we do? Should we cut them out of her diet? So the answer is no, and this is just to illustrate our rule of thumb. If the patient is able to eat a food without a reaction, they are not allergic to it. They may be sensitized to it in the blood or the skin testing, but they're not allergic to it. So we always have to take our results with a grain of salt. Uh, another question we get often is, Jimmy has hives. Can we tell what food he's allergic to? So hives do not always necessarily mean a food allergy. In fact, most times it, hives are due to um, a viral infection or a bacterial infection, or sometimes we never figure out the cause of hives. Um, but we always want to rule out whether there is a food allergy going on because that could be potentially dangerous. So anyone who's had hives for less than six weeks that can be readily identified as being linked to a food should definitely have testing. But just because someone has hives does not necessarily mean that they have a food allergy. So something to keep in mind. A diary connecting what is eaten in um, onset or in relation to the onset of hives is always very helpful. Another question. Little Annie is allergic to eggs, but she eats egg baked um, goods with egg in them, like Eggo waffles, muffins, cookies. Do we need to stop? The answer is no. So all of our evidence is showing that ingesting these small amounts of uh, baked protein is going to be helpful in outgrowing the food allergy. The exception here is people who have severe eczema that gets worse with baked goods. Then we like to cut it out completely uh, because their eczema can get very bad and become infected. The question of siblings always comes up. So little Jack has a, has a soy allergy. What do we do about Susie, who's two months old? How do we introduce foods? Um, so currently the understanding, given the, the thought that um, avoidance may be more harmful than good, is that patients at risk for developing food allergy do not need to limit their exposure to foods. So in general, we tell people that are siblings of food allergy to just uh, siblings of those with food allergy to introduce foods as normal after four to six months. Um, preemptive testing is not recommended. However, we do it as a service to our patients anyway because I think it makes all of us feel better. Um, here's another cartoon to end our talk. So it's never good news if you're a cow and you are allergic to dairy. <laughs> so I'll just leave you with a couple thoughts. When to suspect a food allergy? So if you or somebody you know has symptoms like an itchy rash, drooling, cough, swelling, increased asthma, abdominal pain, severe vomiting and diarrhea, or feeling faint within 30 to 60 minutes of ingesting a particular food, it may be a food allergy. A child or an adult who has eczema that seems to get worse around certain foods may have a food allergy. One thing that I see very often being a pediatric allergist, a child who repeatedly spits out a food and says, that I don't like it, it's almost always egg. He doesn't like egg. He spits it out right away. It's like 99% of the time it's a food allergy because what happens is it doesn't feel good on their tongue, so therefore they spit it out right away. So if any of these are, are problems or you know anybody who has any of these symptoms, please you know, consult an allergist. So take home points, um, IgE mediated or true food allergy can be distinguished from food intolerances, including gluten intolerance. The incidence is unfortunately on the rise and we're not sure why. The best treatment for an allergic reaction is always going to be injectable epinephrine, unless it's a very mild reaction. So if you have a food allergy or a relative with a food allergy, please insist that they carry it at all times. It, it's, it's so life-saving. Uh, there are very exciting new advances that uh, are probably going to bring a cure for all food allergies within the next five to ten years. We're very excited for that. Uh, but for right now, all we have is the baked egg and the baked milk, milk um, ingestion challenges. But they do offer potential for outgrowth of both food, uh, I'm sorry, both milk and egg allergies, and they're offered locally. So consult an allergist if you have any questions about the latest and best treatment of food allergies. 
Here are some patient and family resources, both the American College of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology have great patient information sections on their website. Also, the Food Allergy and Anaphylaxis, Anaphylaxis Network, used to be called FAN or F-A-A-N, has now merged with several other groups and it's called FAIR, Food Allergy Research and Education. They have the most wonderful patient resources um, and they also have talks and walks in the area. So it's something that you can check out as well. And that's www.foodallergy.org. Here are some references. Feel free to contact me if you want any of them. And then I'll leave you with another cartoon. So this, unfortunately, is the life of too many people who are avoiding foods. It's wheat-free, dairy-free, fat-free, nut-free, sugar-free, and salt-free. Enjoy. Sounds like the worst birthday ever, right? So let's try to work hard and cure food allergies. So thank you very much for taking your hard-earned free time and coming to our talk about food allergies. Um, please contact us with any questions. Um, either myself or any of the other doctors in our practice are very well-versed in food allergy. Um, this is me. That's actually a picture of me at a children's museum standing next to the organs I love best, lungs and a nose that's dripping yellow mucus. Um, <laughs> we have three locations, uh, one right down the street on and, uh, Belrose Drive here in central San Jose. We have a Los Gatos uh, location, west, San, west South San Jose, which is by Good Samaritan Hospital, and then one in Mountain View over at El Camino Hospital. And we have um, Saturday availability and extended shot hours. So if you need any information, just let us know. Merrily, our, our uh, practice administrator is at the back there with um, some information. And I'm happy to take questions at this time. Okay, I'm gonna go. Uh, first. Mm -hmm. You know, it really depends on the specific food intolerance, but it looks like the most common mechanism is probably more T cell mediated. So T cells are another arm of the immune system, which are very, very active in the gut. In fact, T cell, most of your body's T cells tend to live near the gut. So that's the, the reigning thought right now is that it's more T cell mediated rather than allergy antibody mediated. But there's no common mechanism um, aside from that that I know of. Great question though. All right, who's next? Ma'am? Um, if you have food allergy, then, um, it sounds like you would recommend that every patient has food allergy should carry like 10 Yes. Um, I have no problems with my doctor. He just automatically gave me a prescription. Great. But I have a relative whose doctor refuses to give me Oh. And, and so, I mean, does he go shopping around? What should I tell him to do? You know, it's a sticky situation because I don't know the provider. Um, my personal feeling is that everybody with a food allergy needs to have an EpiPen. Um, I would suggest that anybody with a food allergy not only have a primary care physician, but also be seen by an allergist. So I would suggest that your relative be seen by an allergist. Just because food allergy does change, and oftentimes we monitor our patients with food allergy because they can outgrow it. So I would consult an allergist. All right, sir? Your, was your question, do people who have allergies as children tend to have them resolve as adults? Well, both, uh, my growing up child is an adult, has oh. that, still has allergies, okay. they never go away. It could. Um, you said it was a shellfish allergy? No, peanut and peanut, peanut and tree nut. Okay. Okay, so peanut and tree nut allergy, only about 20% of them resolve, but that's still 20%. So we do recommend that even uh, adults who have food allergy, grown-up children, see an allergist every so often for testing because there are teenagers, adults, and people in their 50s, 60s, 70s who can outgrow food allergies. So a lot of the questions like that, difficulty patch type, the peanut patch, the VR, something that you show. Way to get rid of the allergies for another drug. Absolutely.
Absolutely. Absolutely. Any of these treatments, the oral immunotherapy, the baked um, allergy therapy, and then also the peanut patch, I think are going to be great options in the future. They're just not available yet. I think that the peanut patch is very intriguing because the, react the systemic reactions have been much, much, much less with the peanut patch than anything else. What? Well, some, you know, some allergies are life-threatening and will continue to be life-threatening even if small amounts of peanut are ingested or exposed in the skin. Some people are just unfortunately way more sensitive than others. Um, but you know, one, product, one reaction doesn't predict another. So just because there's a severe allergy one time doesn't mean that the severe allergy is going to persist. But in general, it's safer, I think, at least, to have a little bit of peanut on your arm than in your mouth. Yeah. There actually is. There actually is. So great question. Um, I'll just mention very briefly, but we do have venom allergy testing. Almost every allergist does it. Um, and basically what we do is we do that same kind of scratch testing to a number of different venoms. So we have honeybees, we have wasps, fire ants, you name them. So it's a bit of a process. It'll take a couple hours because we have to do some injections as well, but we do have testing for that. So if you're interested, you know, grab a, grab a card. Yes? Um, my daughter and I have both been escape tested, mm -hmm. and we were off the charts as far as findings, um, environmental as well as food allergies. Mm -hmm. What was so strange uh, to me for her is that this is just very related to carrots, oatmeal, apples, just, you know, and nuts and all kinds of things. So she's trying to eat healthy, and just really trying to you know, make emotions about like her apples in it. Well, I do notice that sometimes when she's apple, she's okay. Sometimes her lips will get like that picture. Um, she did have an incident, she just carried an incident mm -hmm. when she had this strep. And um, this is the first time it's ever happened to when somebody had that intro where it's part of somebody had that intro. Mm -hmm. and, and I went off and more than a girl, but I, I, I should probably know what I know now. I can even take her to the emergency room and I can do that. Mm -hmm. So she carries an incident now. Great. But you know, then I'm thinking, thinking what you're saying about these allergies. Right. So I like what you said, you know, you don't have a reaction. But with the apples, for example, sometimes there's a reaction, sometimes she doesn't. Mm -hmm. Could it be the, the pollen that's in the apple? Could it, could it be that she's allergic to it? Both of us would be kind of weird and unusual. <laughs> you know, we, we have such um, allergies to wheat and to things that are out there mm -hmm. in the environment. Could it be that that gives you the fruit and that affects her when she ingests the stuff? My suspicion is, is more likely that it, it represents some kind of oral allergy syndrome where um, she's having that, pro, that uh, pollen food protein cross reaction that's causing problems. That's my suspicion. Well, you know, anytime you think you have to use an EpiPen, I say just go ahead and use it just in case. That, that the shrimp time. Yeah, the shrimp time, that's definitely EpiPen worthy. But it does sound more like an oral allergy syndrome. We don't see true food allergy to apples very often. And oatmeal? <laughs> oatmeal, not so much either. Typically, those are the, the cross reactions between the food protein and the pollen. You know, there, sometimes the, the, the skin testing will be positive, and sometimes it will be negative if they have oral allergy syndrome. And it really depends on how the apple is prepared. So if she's able to tolerate baked apple, but not the raw fruit, that would be more suggestive of the oral allergy syndrome. I would maybe think about scheduling an appointment with her allergist and ha maybe doing a baked apple challenge in the, in the clinic. That's what I would do if she were my patient. I would have you guys bake an apple and then try it in the clinic. So hope that answers your question. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Only proteins. Only, only proteins. That's the only thing that's recognized by um, T and B cells immunologically. And I developed clearly this allergy. I break out of my citrus. And so then Thank you.
Usually it's just within the citrus group with citrus allergy. Typically not. Typically it's just all citrus. If you tend to be allergic to one type of citrus, I think, th I know there, there was no um, number on the chart, but I think it's 50 to 70% chance that you have allergies to other citrus. But there's no, like, if you're allergic to citrus, you're also going to be allergic to apple. That's what I'm saying. Other people Tomatoes are technically an acidic fruit, too. That's the only link, though. Tomatoes are a fruit, not a vegetable. But no, there's there's no known other allergy lo um, association that I know of, at least. Citrus, citrus allergy is actually fairly rare, so you you are a rare person. The only good thing about it is I've been lost 25 pounds because there's very little. I can't eat mayonnaise in it, cut fruit, get clipped like a cucumber. Yeah. 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 Ye